so this session uh, seems to be a solo session, but um, I'll get it recorded anyway. This session is really to do with uh, testing for uh, medical schools. So if you apply to the UK, you're going to need to take an aptitude test. So aptitude tests are designed to be fairer than doing your APs, A-levels, IBs, um, because a question held over the validity um, at times of how well um, the results have been given out in, the, in these COVID times, whether or not it's the algorithm that is putting doubt into um, how well of how well they uh, represent the students' abilities. So more emphasis may be placed on aptitude tests for this academic year and the next. So it's designed to be fairer. Um, it's a test that everybody does and scores can be kept compared against each other directly. It tests the aptitude as well as the application of knowledge. They're also designed to try to find the best potential doctors. So who uses what? As you may be aware that there is the UCAT and there is the BMAT. The number of schools or universities that look at the UCAT, uh, which are the ones in blue here, you can see that there are more uh, universities that, that use UCAT as their aptitude test. The red ones are BMAT. It can be argued that the more competitive ones are using the BMAT. So Brighton and Sussex actually having more applicants per places, so therefore being very competitive. Imperial, Oxford and Cambridge also included with the BMAT. However, if you were to come up with a strategy to decide to study for one or the other, you can see that by focusing on the UCAT, you have more options available in front of you. So let's focus on the UCAT. The UCAT is the University Clinical Aptitude Test. It's replaced the UK CAT, which was in 2019. The exam runs between the 26th of July to the 29th of September. 2021. It's required by the majority of medical schools as we've seen on that last map. It's a two hour computerized test and it's sat in either test centers or online. And the online testing is dependent on the COVID restrictions. So in previous years, when we're not in a COVID uh, situation, these are all taken in a specific test center. Due to uh, the, the nature of the restrictions with COVID-19, uh, the UCAT has moved towards going online. Students need to register and sit these independently. It's not something that happens inside school. And they can only be sat once per year. So that means if you want to take a gap year, but you do a UCAT this year, um, and then you take a year out, it means that during that year out, you're going to need to, to reset the, the UCAT because it's only valid for that, for that specific year. So here is the timeline for the UCAT. Here you can see that on the 2nd of June 2021, the registration will open. The deadline that students will be facing is the 15th of October. However, obviously, uh, in ACS, we aim to finish everything um, by the 1st of October. So the test booking begins on the 28th of June, 2021. Testing begins in, on the 26th of July, 2021. And then registration and booking will close by the 22nd of September, 2021. And the last test date will run through on the 29th of September, 2021. All these results will be given to universities early in November 2021. We find that the best time for students to take this is usually in August, simply because it gives them a bit more time to prepare for it. And uh, by that time, they're back in school and they're focused um, and, and back into learning. So let's now take a look at the UCAT scoring. It tests, the UCAT will test five sections. There is verbal reasoning, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, decision-making and situational judgment tests. 900 points for each section are given to the first four sections. And then there's a separate standalone score given to the situational judgment test. Students usually score between um, 1,200 and 3,600, 3,600 points. A, a separate score given uh, for, uh, for the standalone score in the situational judgment test, where students are allocated uh, a band from one to four. So here we can see a table with past scores uh, with the average scores for the UCAT. 
So here, if we just look at the verbal reasoning, we can see that the verbal reasoning scores in general have been around about the 570 mark. Quantitative reasoning scores, uh, you can see the scores there. You can see there's a slight trend slightly downwards since 2017. The abstract reasoning, students seem to be scoring slightly more um, as time has gone on in, in, the, in those. And the decision analysis and decision making section, around about the same since 2018, yet uh, they were slightly higher in 2017. So here we can see the totals for each year and an average for each different section can be seen at the bottom as well. So how much time are you given for each section? This table shows us what, how much time is given for each section. So a standardized UCAT test, we're looking at 22 minutes for the verbal reasoning, 32 minutes for the decision making, 25 minutes for the quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, 14 minutes, and situational judgment, 27 minutes. So in total, there is 120 minutes for a standardized uh, UCAT. So how is the UCAT used by each specific um, medical school? Well, different medical schools will have different policies. Some will rank their students and applicants by uh, the UCAT score. Uh, some will use the UCAT uh, in terms of points allocation for, um, for groups. There might be a minimum cutoff point for some uh, universities that, um, that are looking at their applicants. And some universities might use it only in borderline cases and look at the rest of the application. Uh, and some universities may not use it at all, although request to see the score. So the verbal reasoning section assesses your ability to read and think carefully about information that's presented to you in a passage and determine whether a specific conclusions can be drawn from the information that, you're, that they're given. Quickly reading 11 short passages of text, uh, students then need to identify key information, draw their correct conclusions, and there are two types of questions. The decision-making subtest uh, will uh, assess your ability to apply logic to reach a decision or a conclusion or to evaluate arguments and analyze situational information. There are multiple question formats, 29 questions given in the 31 minutes, and it does require some knowledge. Quantitative reasoning assesses your ability to use numerical skills to solve problems. It assumes familiarity with numbers to kind of around the standard of a good pass at GCSE, which basically means a good level of maths uh, up to grade 10. However, items are less However, items are less to do with the numerical facility and more to do with problem solving itself. So you'll be given nine scenarios with four questions each. Information can be presented to you in the form of tables, graphs, bar charts or pie charts, diagrams or in text. You are actually given a calculator. There's a calculator function available in the actual test itself. However, we recommend that you do come in and you use a calculator similar to the one on the right. The TTI-108 is a good example of what you should be using um, because we find that students find it quite challenging to open up the windows where the questions are, then you, it's quite fiddly, then you have to close it and then open up the calculator, write down what you see on the calculator or your calculations down on a piece of paper and then, and then pull up the, the next tab. So really uh, a little tip for the quantitative reasoning to, to come in with your own calculator. And that's our recommended calculator. The abstract reasoning assesses your ability to identify patterns among abstract shapes where irrelevant and distracting material may lead to some incorrect conclusions. Just 13 minutes are given for 55 questions. And there are four question types. There's type one and four, students have to identify the static patterns and type two and three, where identifying dynamic patterns that are constantly changing. So here's an example of a question that you might find in an abstract reasoning test. I'll just pause to give you a chance to, to have a look. And finally, uh, the situational judgment test measures your capacity to understand real world situations and identify critical factors and appropriate behavior that you need in dealing with them. So this might include uh, concepts such as honesty and integrity, 
pressure and prioritization, communication skills, teamwork and leadership, ethical and moral dilemmas, as well as patient safety. Remember, this is the band one to four that's allocated separate to the other four sections above. Using the strategy of understand the test, apply your knowledge, and then consolidate by having timed online mocks. So when I say understand, it means things such as learning your theory. You can do this by looking at books, going on to online courses, using the materials that we have as well on the PSL, where Mr. Singh goes through uh, questions in different sections within the UCAT. Uh, you could also go to uh, the Medic Portal website or even the UCAT website itself as well to get a general understanding about the knowledge that you need and, and learn the theory behind uh, the, and the style of questions that you're going to have. Familiarize yourself with it. Then the next thing you should really look to do to best prepare is to try to learn how to apply your knowledge. So using online question banks is a good way to do this. The UCAT have an online question bank and so do the Medix portal have one. Once you've done some practice, then start timing yourself in a more exam environment. So give yourself some timed online mocks to help consolidate what you're, you're learning. The UCAT recommends spending around 21 to 30 hours preparing for the exam. This is the amount of preparation done by the highest scoring respondents to, to their surveys. If you're looking for help in preparing for UCAT, uh, if you could follow this link here on the medical portal, where to apply with a high UCAT score in 2021 entry. And also there are a range of different things within Medic Portal website that you'll find where you can help. So they, they, have, they have online courses, they have uh, online question banks, but also you can check out the PSL page as well because we really support you with this as well with uh, Mr. Singh's videos. So I've included this slide because at the time I was making this, uh, Mr. Singh hadn't quite made any examples um, for his, um, with his videos, but since then he's been adding videos in the UCAT section. The coming soon is actually happening and each week he adds in um, new questions each week. Now moving on to the BMAT. The BMAT is the biomedical admissions test. It's a two-hour pen and paper test. It combines knowledge and aptitude and it focuses on students ability to use logic and applying existing knowledge. It's designed to find the best potential doctors and it's required by seven medical schools, Oxford, Cambridge, UCL, Imperial, Brighton and Sussex. These five are some of the most competitive to get into, as well as Leeds and Lancaster. When and where is the BMAT? So well, it's taken at ACS or at a local test centre. Results are valid for only one year, as with the UCAT. And here's a provisional timetable for the 2021 that we have. We've got an opening date of the 1st of September, closing date of the 15th of October, and another test date on the 3rd of November, and results date on the 27th of November. So you can see that this is slightly later than the UCAT. So if you were a student that was looking at trying to use both the UCAT and the BMAT in your applications, then Saving the BMAT for last and preparing for the UCAT first is the best way to go. So how's the scoring done in the BMAT? Well, in, there's section one and section two in the BMAT. Every question is worth one mark. The total mark is scaled to a nine point BMAT scale. There's no negative marking and there's a range from one to nine. So a typical successful candidate will score a 5.0. And the best candidates will score about 6.0. And there are very few exceptional candidates that are scoring above the 7.0 region for the section. In section three, two scores are generated. There's the first, the alphabetical A to E for the quality of the English and the numerical one to five for the quality of the content. And it's marked by two examiners and an average is taken. So if we were to look at a bell curve, for the past scores in 2020, you can see that anything that is above 
generally we find that students that are above this kind of mean scoring, um, uh, which is highlighted in the yellow uh, in section one, they're usually the, the students that are, are, are admitted and, and, and successful. So we can see that the section one score, you're looking at a 4.3 to a 4.6 in general for section one. In section two, between 4.3 and 4.6, this is your average there, and anything above the average is a very good score. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see how students in section three scored uh, as well in the previous sitting. Let's look at section one a little bit more to, to learn a little bit more. It's a 60 minutes. There are 32 MCQ questions which gives you about 112.5 seconds per question. It includes maths, verbal and spatial reasoning questions. It also tests you on aptitude and skills, such as generic problem solving skills, critical thinking and understanding arguments. Section two requires knowledge. So you need to have a, a background in science before going in. And there are 27 key stage four type level questions. So that means we're talking maths, physics, chemistry, and biology questions that are around about the grade 10 level. Six questions for maths and seven in each of the um, three sciences there. So giving you a total of 30 minutes, there's a total of 30 minutes for this section. Um, and so you've got about 60 seconds per question. It really is assessing your ability to apply scientific knowledge that you would have normally have covered at 16. It may be a bit more challenging than what you would find at GCSE or grade 10 level, uh, but um, the, the, the focus is on applying that scientific knowledge and your ability to do so. Now, if there is a science that you haven't been able to cover before uh, going into the BMAT, so not all students would have covered, for example, physics, then if this is the case, then you really need to make sure that you're spending time during the summer holidays, potentially even before, to try to, to try and catch up to, the, to that general level of knowledge that, that we're looking at. Okay, and that's where Mr. Singh comes into play as well. Section three gives you a choice of three essay questions. You need to answer one of those and you're given 30 minutes. Your answer must fit into one sheet of paper, like you can see here, and it's, a, and it's a, testing your ability to select develop and organize ideas and to communicate them in writing both concisely and effectively. So here's a previous section three question. The scientist is not someone who gives the right answers, but one who asks the right questions. Explain what this statement means. Argue to the contrary that the right answers are more important than the right, than the right questions. To what extent do you agree that the right questions must be asked before science can progress? So you'd need to select one of those and then put your answer on that one sheet of paper. So what do you need to do to prepare for the BMAT? Well, you're gonna need a roughly about eight weeks worth of preparation. If you haven't had particularly much of a strong background in one of the sciences, for example, you haven't studied physics or you haven't studied biology, uh, to the level that is required, then obviously you're going to need more than those eight weeks. So planning ahead and being aware of what you need to do first will help make sure that you are ready for, for the exam. Utilize free resources. There are lots of past papers on the BMAT website. There's an online BMAT science guide and there's a BMAT syllabus as well that you can, you can find for free. You can get additional help in the form of courses, which you can also find once again on the Medics portal, as well as question banks. But you can also find a wealth of books out there to, to help him. And if you go to see Mr. Singh, I'm sure that he'll be able to help you, point you in, in the right direction. He may even have a book or two as well to help you. Using published books, question banks, online resources, these can all be found on, on the Medics portal as well as being supported by uh, Mr. Singh's uh, video lessons as well that he has where he addresses specific questions and we've, up we've been uploading those on the PSL. 